Hey guys, back for another video. Um, the topic today will be epitaxy. Um, administratively, uh, I've gotten a few of the homeworks already. Homework six, the last homework of the quarter. Um, but if you need the weekend, feel free to turn it in on Monday. Um, regarding uh, the content for next week, um, the question I posed on Teams about um, whether we should keep or scrap the case studies. Um, uh, I only heard back from a couple of you, but it was pretty, uh, uh, of the feedback that I did get, it seemed like um, there was a consensus that we should scrap the case studies, which I am totally okay with. So next week we will finish up Campbell. Uh, the last couple chapters, he gets into devices, and I'm just going to present a really condensed version. We've been condensing four or five chapters into a few pages of notes just to try to make the connection between the fabrication techniques we've been talking about to some real devices. Now, the UWE folks um, will probably uh, be really basic, but um, for the material science, uh, the, the goal is to just uh, make make that basic connection. And then I have um, some material on nanotechnology um, and uh, how that differs from what we've been talking about um, in, in the mic microfabrication, kind of in the, in the micro regime. So in nanotech, you go one in the uh, several orders of magnitude smaller, and, and some things change. Um, so, uh, and then that will leave Friday for uh, Q&A. So, um, I'll also be posting final review sheet and the final exam uh, equation sheet, and uh, the format for the final will be similar to the midterm. I think that worked out uh, fairly well. Um, also, next week, be, look, be on the lookout for course critiques. That will be um, similar to how, it was, how it's been done in person in EMP, where um, you, know, you answer a couple of questions and then submit it anonymously. Uh, this time, it's not going to be paper version that's collected by, say, a class leader and turned into charity. It will be something that, uh, that you'll have to email to her so she can um, compile it. I think the execution of the course critiques is still a little up in the air. There was some mention of maybe using Canvas to do it and saving charities some work. Um, they're they're going to have to figure that out um, by the beginning of next week so that we can, if we're going to get any feedback this quarter. Um, yeah, administrative, this is a little bit longer than normal. Uh, I have one more thing. Oh, um, no, I don't remember. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about um, epitaxy. Um, and before I start, so there, I have four pages of notes here. And um, the chapter has a lot more detail, obviously, than I'm going to cover here. Um, I'm, I'm focusing on the basics, and uh, if I'm, you know, to be honest, the further we go into this material, um, the less comfortable I am with it. Meaning, um, you know. Uh, Just maybe not, comfort may not be the right word, but just the depth of my experience. Um, a lot of this stuff is uh, getting sort of outside of my wheelhouse. But my goal is to condense the basics, the, the main points, um, and to tie it back to what we've been talking about um, uh, in, in our previous, uh, previous chapters, the other techniques. Um, okay, so epitaxial growth. Uh, how does that differ from what we've been talking about? Well, 
just the word epitaxy um, is when you grow one crystalline material on top of another. Now, the crystalline part here is one of, is a de defining factor because we've been talking about, especially last lecture, we were talking about growing one material on top of another in the chemical vapor deposition, um, where we are depositing, you know, some material on top of another. But in in traditional uh, CBD, we're kind of thinking about um, to try to find an analogy. I guess those those layers are kind of like. I don't know, uh, peanut butter and jelly, right? Where you have the bread and you are layering another type of material on top. You want to have good adhesion, um, but you're not necessarily interested or uh, require that the interface be clean. That's the major difference uh, with epitaxial growth. Epitaxial growth, you are trying to uh, have both materials be crystalline and if possible even have that crystalline structure um, be consistent through the interface right so epitaxy epi means above taxis means in an ordered manner so you're depositing material on top of another material in an ordered manner um, and so there are some techniques in epitaxy that sound an awful lot like CBD, but the difference is that you, you take an extra level of care to deposit the material on top um, such that uh, you maintain that crystal structure uh, if possible. Right? It's sort of like rather than making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and spreading you know, peanut butter on the bread, uh, you're kind of it's kind of like building another layer of Legos, right? Where uh, you might switch from blue Legos to red Legos, but you're still going to click them in together when you have a, a new layer. Um, okay, so uh, how they interface at, uh, at the interface between the two materials um, is an important consideration and divides epitaxial layers into a couple different categories. Um, at the most basic, you have homo epitaxy, which um, is when you're growing the same material on top of another material. So that would be like silicon substrate and then depositing uh, epitaxial silicon on top of it, right? That would be silicon on silicon, it's the same material. And so you're going to have uh, a good interface because it's the same material, it has the same size atom, it has the same um, the lattice spacing. Um, once you go to depositing one material on a different material, then you have one of two options, right? You can uh, have the bonds at the interface be um, consistent um, without any broken bonds. And if you're depositing a different material, you're not going to have the same lattice constant, right? I mean, you can have close, but it's not going to be exactly the same. And so if you're going to maintain the same bonding um, across the interface, then uh, one material is going to have to adjust, right? So you're going to have some lattice strain um, on whichever one is making the big adjustment. Um, right, so here you're kind of, this is kind of depicting the fact that the lattice constant would normally be, say, something longer like this, but it's being constrained to match up with the silicon and the underlying substrate. So this sort of scenario is called pseudomorphic. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that can um, exist if the mismatch in lattice spacing is relatively small. Um, the greater the mismatch, right, the more um, you're going to be straining the, uh, the layer that is, that is being constrained eventually uh, it reaches a limit, right, where it, it's lower energy to just have some of these dangling bonds and to have mismatch than it would be to strain the slides so severely. And in that case, you transition from pseudomorphic to a strain-relaxed incommensurate, right? So incommensurate meaning they don't match, and uh, rather than straining one excessively, um, 
you just uh, basically they each take whatever lattice spacing uh, is best for them and they bond where they can. Uh, sometimes um, you have broken bonds or uh, strained strained uh, bonds sort of. So incommensurate um, interfaces are not as um, ordered, right, as the other as the other kind. But um, if you have a big lattice mismatch, that's the best you'll be able to do. Um, so if you are going to uh, deposit new material and you want to um, um, maintain the crystalline nature across the interface, now obviously you need to access that underlying crystal structure, right? So if you have silicon, if we recall back to the oxidation, right, any time that you have silicon exposed to air, it's going to oxidize very rapidly. And we get a very thick oxide layer, but you're going to have that native oxide almost all the time. And so if you're going to deposit a material onto the substrate silicon, you're going to need to obviously remove that oxide layer. Um, and that's in addition to other surface contaminants that can exist, like organics. Maybe you'll have um, uh, residue from photoresist or uh, deposits from vacuum pump oil or fingerprints, uh, hopefully not. Um, but you have some organic contaminants and then you can also have metal particles which um, could come from the vacuum chamber or whatever source. Um, and so before you deposit that layer, you obviously want to have a really clean surface. And so you, uh, you can remove those organics with say ammonium hydroxide or hydrogen peroxide, uh, the metal particles um, you can, uh, right, so there's these oxidation reduction uh, reactions that remove a lot of these contaminants or from that in the um, case of metals you could um, etch them away with a dilute acid um, and then that dilute acid would also remove the oxide layers. So the cleaning is essentially like um, a light etching step. Right, where you're going to etch away um, any contaminating particles or this thin native oxide. Oh, and I, I should have mentioned when we were talking about lattice constants here that the lattice mismatch to silicon can be uh, significant even for other semiconductors, right? So um, here you would have, and you notice that as you go from group four, so group four, you've got good, good, good matching, right? Germanium and silicon are basically they have great lattice mismatch. You can actually substitute germanium into the silicon matrix, right? We've talked about, uh, for instance, with um, ion implantation. Sometimes they will uh, create amorphous silicon by implanting germanium, right? Germanium in group four goes right on the same lattice as the silicon, no problem. So you can obviously uh, grow silicon on top of germanium or vice versa um, and have a commensurate um, interface. But as you go from group four to three, five, and then over here to two, six, and these more exotic compound semiconductors, you see that the lattice mismatch uh, gets larger or the lattice constant gets larger, which creates a lattice mismatch. All right. So you got to clean the surface. Then how are epitaxial layers grown? Um, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that a lot of some of this will sound very similar to uh, CBD, and uh, that's especially the case for vapor phase epitaxy. Right, you've got a very similar setup to low pressure uh, chemical vapor deposition, where you have your reactant gases flowing into a chamber. Um, the chamber is held at an elevated temperature. Uh, you can have a reaction limited or flow limited uh, regime where, um, right, if we recall, you're either limited by how fast the reaction occurs on the surface with no restriction on molecules getting to the surface, or you have a fast reaction rate, whereas you're limited by how fast you can get the molecules to the surface. Um, and in the case of uh, 
the vapor phase epitaxy, uh, the, the difference is, is the care that you take to grow these sperms uh, slowly. So, um, and that's kind of the, the key to getting high quality, um, high quality materials is, is to take your time and, and allow uh, time for those atoms to arrange themselves in a highly ordered way. Um, and so um, if, we, if we heat the susceptor, we can control the temperature of our wafers. Um, and if we grow them slowly at a lower temperature, um, not only are we going to have less diffusion from previous steps, but we're also going to grow a more perfect film um, at, a, at a lower growth rate uh, that comes along with a lower temperature. Um, same thing with uh, right lower lower temperature, lower pressure. Um, all these uh, changes are conducive to slow growth, right? And so that should be con that should be consistent. If we recall back to the very beginning where we talked about the Tchaikovsky method of growing uh, silicon uh, crystal. Uh, bulls, right? It was a very slow process. You, you can solidify silicon rapidly, but you're, you're going to get uh, polycrystalline material. If you want to get a single crystal, high quality silicon bull, uh, you got to grow it slowly. And so the same thing uh, happens here, right? So if you run it at lower temperatures and lower flows, you get better films with less impurities. But, uh, but you know, aside from slowing things down and doing it, doing it more carefully and um, more slowly, uh, this looks very similar, right? Where you have this like this tilted, uh, use this tilted sample holder to help to you know equalize the the, the flow across it. Uh, you've got these are coils to heat it. Obviously, this is in the vacuum um, to be at low pressure. And so uh, the process sounds a lot like C, uh, CBD. It is, um, and we model it. Um, in a way that should be very familiar uh, from our oxidation chapter. So oxidation and epitaxy are both uh, chemical reactions. Um, and uh, we can use the same model to model uh, vapor phase epitaxy that we used for oxidation, that being the deal model. And if we recall there, the deal model, we, uh, we had a free stream velocity, then we had mass transfer coefficient to get through the stagnant um, layer near the surface. Then we had uh, adsorption and diffusion through the growing oxide layer and then reaction at the surface here. You don't necessarily you don't have, uh, you know, you are depositing at the surface, so you don't have diffusion through that growing layer. Um, and, but uh, in other respects, it's similar in, in to, to that model. and uh, can be run in either the transport limited or reaction limited regime. It's kind of dependent upon which one's greater, right? Is it your mass transfer coefficient across the boundary layer, or is it your surface reaction rate, right? And whichever one is slower will dictate what regime you are in for that model, right? So it's similar to oxidation, but it's actually a little bit simpler because you don't have that diffusion through the growing layer since you're depositing or growing on the surface. Um, and then the deal model is felt relatively simple uh, to begin with, and uh, that's nice, but it's but it's not quite accurate because it's an oversimplification. Um, here, you know, we're, we are uh, disregarding the fact that uh, the the species that is um, that is reacting on the surface is usually not the same as the chemical that we are injecting into the chamber as the feed gas, right? We have many intermediate reactions that are occurring in the gas phase and on the surface uh, that are not immediately apparent. But if you're going to model the reaction accurately, then you need to include those individual reactions and determine what their rate constants are um, and, and include them, as, uh, you know, unless uh, you can you can probably get away with excluding them, like we said in, uh, in CBD, if the reaction rates are very small, 
or um, the, the the reaction is, is infrequent. Right? So you don't have to keep absolutely everything, just the ones that are uh, the biggest contributors. And of course, all these side reactions are going to be competing with the main one that you that you are trying to accomplish. Um, and here it just explains a little bit of that. So you have this rate, right? So that'd be your deposition rate, and uh, it's dependent upon, in various in various ways, the uh, the rate constant of the reaction at the surface that is forming that deposition, um, you know, depositing the silicon or, or whatever material you're, you're you're growing, and then you have this mass coefficient, um, uh, mass transfer coefficient across the boundary layer. Um, and then this would be the number of, I guess, atoms that you're laying down. And then the C sub G, that's the constant, I believe. And perhaps that's the concentration of the gas. I, I forget. Um, and so you have these various steps, right, where you have, uh, for this instance, where you have this dichlorosilane, the deposit in silicon. You have uh, the feed gas, dichlorosilane, and hydrogen uh, flowing into the chamber. And it doesn't just immediately react, right? It needs to decompose, right? So here's an example of these intermediates that form, right? So you give off a hydrogen, you have this uh, dichlorosilane, then it adsorbs to the surface, diffusing through that stagnation layer. Um, and then once it's, um, well, first it diffuses, then it adsorbs. And then once it's adsorbed to the surface, right, you could have surface diffusion uh, before it decomposes, um, leaving silicon in particulate calcium or PSHCl, which then needs to desorb, right? So then you have the silicon atom on the surface, and it can also uh, diffuse around the surface uh, before uh, joining up with the growing film, as we'll talk about in this uh, set of notes in the BCF, BCF theory. And uh, the example we showed on the previous page is, um, is a common one, especially for depositing um, silicon, so doing silicon epitaxy. Um, it, it's common to start with these uh, chlorosilanes. So you have um, different numbers of chlorine, right, up to four, um, and then the, the balance of the bonds will be uh, complete, uh, filled up with, with hydrogen. And so you have these uh, these chlorosilanes, and then also uh, you would have them um, diluted in hydrogen as a carrier gas. And um, the fewer chlorine atoms you have, so if you have a, you know, a one chlorine versus say three or four, uh, you can run your experiment at a uh, at a lower temperature, which is uh, which is good for really high quality films. Um, but the reaction here for these chlorosilanes looks something like this, right? Where you have your chlorosilane, right? This is a sort of a, a daughter molecule or an intermediate, and you have this decomposition of the um, original feed gas. So it's decomposing and then uh, reacting to form solid silicon on the surface and HCl as a byproduct. And so we have an arrow that goes both ways, right? So that the action is going in the forward and back direction um, simultaneously. And so you have some control here in that if you add, uh, certain gases, you can push the reaction in one way or the other, right? For instance, uh, these are competing reactions. And so if you increase the concentration of this dichlorosilane, Right, I have more of this molecule, which is going to tend to push the reaction in the other in the, to the other side. Right, so um, the more of this I have, the more my equilibrium will shift to the left, and that will deposit the silicon. Uh, conversely, if I run my my reaction, my deposition with more HCl, that's going to increase the concentration here on the left side, which pushes the whole reaction to the right and I form more dichlorosilane, right, so that I'm removing silicon and actually etching away the surface. And so it's always this kind of tug of war back and forth between these two concentrations, and so I can describe that 
by this term sigma that uh, is uh, referred to as supersaturation. So here I have um, the partial pressure of silicon versus chlorine uh, in the feed gas and the same in the, uh, in the exhaust. Um, and so if this sigma term is, uh, is negative, right, then I've got um, I've got a situation where I'm where I'm undersaturated, um, and I will um, etch away the surface. Right, so if I'm negative, then I've got a uh, higher proportion here, um, which is going to drive it backwards. Um, positive value means that I've got uh, lots of silicon that are going to be driving it in the other direction. Okay, and so the growth rate, right, we have some constants that come along for the ride, um, but we essentially have this tug of war between uh, the partial pressure of our feed gas versus the partial pressure of our uh, react, of one of our uh, product gases. Um, and that allows you to tune the, uh, the deposition rate. Okay. Excuse me. Um, this will probably be a shorter video today. So it's probably is okay. Um, so you're so you're depositing silicon atoms, um, and what is it, so what's happening at the surface? Um, well, the surface, if you just had silicon there, um, eventually you get to the edge and you have silicon atoms that don't have a full complement of other silicon atoms to bind to to satisfy all of their bonds. And so you have these dangling bonds at the surface. Um, they really don't like that, so they find other things to satisfy those bonds, uh, one of which is hydrogen. Um, and so usually the silicon surface will be hydrogen terminated. Uh, so filling up those extra bonds. Um, and so uh, if you're going to grow that silicon film, excuse me, um, you're going to have to desorb those terminal, terminal hydrogens uh, before you can adsorb your, um, your silicon containing um, reactant gas to the surface. And so um, before it can adsorb, right, you have a, you know, there's a, there's a finite number of sites that it can adsorb to, right? So there's places where these H um, terminal hydrogens have been removed, um, and that uh, the number or the proportion of those sites um, is described by this parameter here. You're done once, and then you're done for. Um, which is uh, the fraction of free sites, and so you can see here that there's a lot more complexity in this expression, and we haven't really developed it here. But it includes uh, partial pressures of um, the reactant gases, uh, the reactant and product gases, and various. Uh, um, constants, right? These are Ks, they're probably rate constants that refer to various rate constants for these steps involved in uh, adsorbing, diffusing, reacting. Um, we're kind of skipping some of the details, but the faster that the reaction is happening, um, the uh, Right, well, the rate at which the reaction happens and the partial pressures of the reactant and product gases are obviously going to dictate in some way how many of those sites are open, right? And so here's an expression that has been derived for that. Um, and, and that goes into the growth rate, right? Because part of this reaction, right, is having the uh, reactant gases adsorbed to the surface. And so if it's going to do that, it needs to have a free site. So you can see here that on the left we have this deposition term, the growth term, 
and that's dependent upon this fraction of free sites because as the free, number of free sites goes to zero, right, the growth should go to zero because there's no place for those um, dichlorosilanes to adsorb to the surface. Um, okay, so you're growing silicon on the surface of other uh, of the substrate, and as we talked about, um, pure silicon is not all that useful, right? It has free carriers that change as a function of temperature, but um, it becomes a lot more useful, especially for building devices, if we can dope it to be either n-type or p-type. Um, and so those dopants can come via diffusion from the substrate. So I might have a doped substrate, which will diffuse um, into the epitaxial layer, or I could have a desorption of a dopant atoms from some other portion of the wafer, movement through the, the gas, and then um, adsorption back onto the surface in a different place and then diffusion into the, into the bulk. Um, I could also have um, dopants in ga you know, gaseous uh, reactants that are carrying that dopant atom. And I would have some sort of a dopant uh, reaction that is depositing those dopant atoms at the same time that I'm growing the silicons, right? So I could be actually growing a doped epitaxial layer at the same time that I'm that I'm creating it, rather than growing pure silicon and then diffusing it in something later. Okay. And if we're concerned about making a high quality epitaxial film, right? What's going to get in the way of that are uh, key effects. And like we said, the difference between uh, CVD and epitaxy is the conditions under which we're growing and the quality of the film. And so here the number of defects uh, is sort of differentiating one from the other and um, if you are careful with the growth condition, conditions you can reduce the number of defects and it's you know so, so the defect is dependent upon the growth rate and other growth conditions um, under which you are depositing your epitaxial film. Um, the most common defect, right, since I am depositing atoms, right, they need to uh, work their way into a, a high quality crystal structure. Um, and sometimes as they're depositing, right, that, that crystal structure gets a little messed up. And so um, that those, those uh, mismatch or those um, atoms that are not in the right place lead to dislocations in the crystal structure and stacking faults. Um, this is a, a surface defect that is uh, showing the stacking fault here. I've got, uh, this is I think uh, an SEM image, it's kind of a, a poor image uh, that I borrowed from Campbell. Um, and it just shows uh, the profile at various points along this, uh, this defect. Um, so we talked about in earlier in earlier lectures, um, I guess in the etch lecture especially, um, the selectivity of one etch process um, for one material over another, right? So, say for instance, chemical etch, you're going to etch away the oxide. A heck of a lot faster in silicon. You can use that to your advantage. Um, you can also do something like that with epitaxy, where uh, nucleation of the, the new epitaxial film occurs much faster on some some straits than others. Right? For instance, it's much faster on bare silicon than it is on oxide um, and on silicon nitride. So, if you have a sample that has different regions. Right. You could actually selectively grow an epitaxial film on one versus another just because of the rate of growth being so much higher on one material than another. Um, 
And here's where we kind of get into various uh, permutations of this technique. That's kind of where all of the material in the chapter comes from. There's a lot of extra detail, kind of trying to condense it down and focus on the basics, like I said. Um, but you can also have metal organic CBD. So here is a very, it's a similar idea where you have uh, gases flowing into a chamber, reacting. You might have a tilted heated susceptor holding your wafer. Um, but in metal organic CBD, you're starting off with, uh, you have your metal atom that you are depositing, right? Whether it's, uh, uh, well, it can be various different metals, but it, it is bonded to by these organic groups. So that's where the organic part of metal organic comes from. And then these obviously need to decompose at the surface to posit that, uh, that atom to grow into the, the glowing film. Um, and, uh, uh, metal organic CBD is going to depend, you know, the quality of the film you get out of it is going to depend on how uniform and constant your gas flow is uh, going into the chamber. The conditions of your chamber, right, is your susceptor tilted to maintain a constant flow, uh, rel relatively uniform from, from the beginning to the front to the back. Um, what's the pressure? Are you in a reaction limited or transport limited regime? How are your wafers arranged? Right, all of those things. Um, and a lot of these metal organic uh, compounds are very toxic, right? So that, that introduces a lot of uh, uh, issues for health, um, especially the arsenic-containing ones, right? You could have a cylinder, if you were to vent a cylinder, you know, you might contaminate or, you know, you could poison an entire city block, something like that. So um, you have to be really careful with these metal organic CBD molecules. Um, okay. The last topic here, well, I guess I have two little ones, right? Before I jump into molecular beam epitaxy, just make one more tie back to earlier techniques that would be rapid thermal processing. So um, we use rapid thermal processing to anneal ion implantation damage without diffusing dopants around. Um, and that can come back to be an element of a lot of these different processing steps is that is once you have a distribution of dopants that you don't want to mess with, um, every time you increase the temperature, you're providing that temperature and, and time that is necessary for diffusion to redistribute those dopant atoms. And so epitaxy is a, an area where you can make use of rapid thermal processing to grow a thin layer without worrying so much about re redistributing the dopant atoms in the surrounding material. And the last little bit here we're going to talk about is molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, I think sometimes when people think about epitaxy, they think about this because other forms of epitaxy are very f similar to CBD and, and other processes. But this one is unique um, and it is used uh, predominantly for compound semiconductor uh, manufacture, especially for gallium arsenide, and uh, it's kind of a combination between, say, CVD and PVD, right, that's chemical and then physical vapor deposition. In the, the, uh, the physical vapor deposition comes from the fact that we are um, evaporating the atoms that will become the, cell, the, uh, the semiconductor film, right, so we have gallium and arsenic in these cells, right? These Knut these Knutson cells, where you have you know heated foils, you have a source that you're evaporating. So you're sending out basically uh, a stream of these atoms into a high vacuum, right? So this whole system is under ultra high vacuum. So to get down to those really low pressures, like 10 to the minus 4, you got ultra high vacuum. You got a, you know, you have the, the advanced cryo pumps we've talked about, ones that have you know, turbo turbo molecular pumps, diffusion pumps, adsorbs, ads, adsorption pumps, uh, just to get down to these lower these lower vacuum levels. Um, you also need to uh, raise the temperature of the system to drive off any adsorbed gases that are on the vacuum walls. Um, and you want to get down to those really low those really low pressures because this stream of atoms that are coming out of these cells, uh, you want them to travel in a straight line just like we did before with metal evaporation. Um, and 
this sort of process is really good for building uh, highly structured semiconductor uh, devices. So um, you can you could deposit you know a certain number of atomic layers of gallium arsenide and then switch to say aluminum gallium arsenide and build up a, you know a quantum device or a semiconductor laser or something of that nature and you have really fine control over the thickness of the layers. Actually you're depositing them one layer at a time and uh, that's kind of what we're going to cover these last two points. So as you're depositing them one layer at a time you can actually count the layers and be very precise as far as how many layers of, of these materials that you are laying down and, and you count them via electron diffraction. So this, this read technique where this reflective high energy electron diffraction, uh, you have an electron gun that is diffracting off of your growing film. And your film grows something like this. This is the BCF theory that says that you know you grow one, la one layer at a time. So you have uh, atoms come in, reaction happens, you adsorb to the surface, uh, then you, you know, uh, well, then a reaction may happen to get rid of, say, you know, other atoms, you know, say HCl in the case of the silicon, as we were talking about before. Um, I guess perhaps not as complicated here because you have this Knudsen cell and it's more of an evaporation, but you adsorb the atoms there and it's not some energy, so it diffuses around. Eventually, it links up with this terrace that is growing. Um, if your deposition rate's too fast, you might have ions that form, but if you keep it slow, you can grow one layer at a time. You can actually monitor that growth through electron diffraction. So the closer I get to a full surface, right, uh, the more uh, order I have in that layer of atoms, and the more highly I will diffract electrons. Um, and so if I look at the diffraction peak of this electron beam, I have the strongest signal right as I'm completing a, a layer, and then as I start a new layer, um, it's going to be degraded until I have, say, one that's half built, right? That would be the highest level of disorder. Um, and then I would reach a, a minimum, and then I would have another maximum. So every time I hit a maximum, right, I've completed a new layer. So I can count the number of layers that I'm depositing uh, one at a time with, with a setup like this, um, which uh, we'll talk about in, in, in the nano, the nano uh, uh, lecture that I'll be posting next week um, about semiconductor layers and how alternating those layers and having very precise thicknesses allows you to build devices for certain wavelengths um, and take advantage of quantum processes, both quantum laws and those sorts of things. Um, so I guess to summarize, save a little bit of time here, um, epitaxy is all about, uh, it's like CVD, but creating high quality films that, that maintain that crystalline structure throughout the interface. All right, thanks.